And talking tax with Tom Yamachika, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and it's a given Thursday morning. And we are honored to have uh, the state auditor, uh, Les Condo, with us today. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Morning. morning, Jay. Morning. So, Tom, can you bring us current? Because we've been talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the life and times of the state auditor for a while here. And there's been a new development, but can you bring us current? Today's title is Probing Management of State Lands Times Two. So give us a handle on what was times one. Okay. So uh, as you may uh, know, the management of our uh, public lands <clears throat> here in the state of Hawaii is done by our Department of Land and Natural Resources. They have something called the Land and Management Division, and they uh, put the uh, money that they get from our state lands in this thing called the Special Land and Development Fund. Uh, the, uh, the fund uh, and the operations leading to it uh, was audited by the, the state auditor uh, in the auditor's report 19-12, which meant that it was done in 2019. And the, uh, the auditor came out with some very critical findings uh, I don't want to say the report was it was a bombshell, but uh, pretty close. Uh, and now what we have is a legislative committee that was formed in the House of Representatives uh, to further investigate uh, the matters that uh, the state auditor already investigated. And uh, uh, we're very, very glad to have uh, this morning with us the state auditor, Les Kondo. Uh, who not only authored uh, the uh, report 19-12, which we had been talking about, and we had a show on this before, but uh, we are now, he is now in the midst of these legislative hearings to further investigate the investigation. Thank you for joining us, Les. Yeah, Welcome. you can never have enough investigations, Les. I mean, and uh, also it's what's interesting about <laughs> it is that yeah. the state legislature taking this action. It's not even in session. It's between sessions. It's just interesting. You know, you think they, they, they meet from January to May or so, but no, no, busy, busy. Anyway, Les, uh, well, how much of what Tom said you agree with and what would you like to add to it? Well, I, I think I agree with everything that Tom said. Um, there was There is a House investigative committee that was formed through a House resolution that was introduced and passed on the very last day of session. And um, on its face, the resolution is uh, uh, empowering the investigative committee to follow up on the audits of the land, uh, the Department of Land and Natural Resources um, Special Land and Development Fund that, that Tom was describing. It also, the purpose of this investigative committee on the face of the resolution is also to follow up on our more recent audit of the Agribusiness Development Corporation that we issued at the beginning of this year. So that's a 2021 audit. Um, I think it's really uh, important that the legislature follow up on the audits because once we issue the audits, uh, which both of these audits, they include findings, meaning we've identified things that we don't think are going so well with, these, with both of these two, two agencies, things that really should get improved. Um, we make recommendations, but at that point, our, our authority, our work ends. We do follow up to assess whether or not the agency has actually implemented re recommendations, whether they've tried to address the audit findings, but um, really we don't have any kind of stick or any kind of other authority to force an agency to do, take any action. Uh, so I thought initially that um, this investigative committee that the House formed, um, at least on its face, on the, on the, you know, within the four corners of the resolution that, that empowered this committee, formed this committee, um, I thought it was really good because I think that it's important that the legislature um, who has the, the stick, so to speak, that they actually follow up on these audits to, to help improve these organizations, to hold them accountable, and to, to get them to, to do their work better than what they're doing at at least the time of the audit. So, yeah, and let, me, let me kind of bring us up to speed on what the first uh, audit found. And let me just read you uh, the summary of findings to kind of like give you the a flavor of how serious this is. Without a strategic plan for its public lands, the land division's management of leases and revocable permits defaults to maintaining the status quo rather than exploring higher and better use. 
lack of complete and coherent policies and procedures prevents the land division from adequately managing its leases and revocable permits. And lack of transparency and accountability hinders the administration of the Special Land Development Fund. What does all that mean? Well, I think uh, kind of at a high level, uh, just in plain English, it means the land division isn't doing its job well enough. Um, it's responsible for managing most of the, the lands that the state owns. And those are lands that are part of the public land trust. They include ceded land. Um, and, and the department, the division itself has designated some of those lands, identified some of those lands as what they call income producing or revenue producing lands. They have a, a lot of other lands that, you know, whether they are conservation lands or, or other types of lands that I don't think anyone really expects to generate much revenue. So we didn't look at those lands. We focused on the revenue or income producing lands. And those are lands that are designated as such by the, by the division. So we wanted to understand how the department was managing those lands, um, whether they were in essence maximizing the revenue from those lands. And instead we found a department or a division that didn't have any kind of strategic plan, a long range plan or an asset management plan. So because of that, like, like you read Tom, uh, it, it was reverting to the status quo. So we, we included a number of examples in our report. So for instance, um, we identified leases in Hilo that were coming up. These are 55 year leases and they were starting to, to expire. Come, I think the first one was expiring in 2014. And there was an opportunity, 70 leases, and these were land leases that were initially um, uh, awarded right after the tsunami in, in Hilo. Um, and these were vacant land leases. And in the 55 years or so, they, there have been improvements that are built on these, on these properties. In other words, there are warehouses and other industrial structures that have been built on these properties. And under the leases, the, the improvements, it reverts to the state upon the expiration of the lease. In other words, the state will own those improvements upon the expiration of the lease. Um, as these leases came up, there was an opportunity for the land division, uh, BLNR, the Board of Land and Natural Resources, to, to take advantage of the fact that they could consolidate some of these properties and, and lease them out now as improved properties. In other words, they would probably be able to generate more income, more revenue, because there were improvements on these properties and not just vacant land leases. Um, unfortunately, the department is, was not prepared for this, what we called in, 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 uh, in our report, uh, uh, this, this event that was, was right at the horizon and, and was going to happen. So rather than being able to, to take over these properties and, and then um, consolidate them and, and then release them, provide opportunities to other members of the public to lease state lands, what they did is they just ended up extending the leases for another 10 years. So instead of being able to generate revenue based upon an improved property, they basically are, are uh, generating revenue from uh, a land lease. In other words, um, a lease that was initially issued without any improvements on it. So we identified also some, some examples. So, are, you, are you saying that uh, this lease was uh, entered into 55 years ago as vacant land and, and and the rent was sent 55 years ago, and it was extended at the same uh, at, at the same price. Are you kidding me? No. Well, not not necessarily at the same price, but based okay. upon an appraisal that is um, a vacant land appraisal. In other words, it's not appraising the value of the of the improvements that are now on the property. So the department or the division didn't get any kind of premium just because there there are. Um, improvements on the property or the fact that they uh, decided not to take over the property. So we have an example in our report where one of the lessees, one of the tenants on the, on, on the state lands, um, they were paying about $75,000 a year in annual lease rent to the state. And that's based upon the initial vacant land lease. And they were not occupying the property. They, had sub, uh, they were subleasing the property to people. They had built a warehouse. And they were earning about $300,000 in sublease revenue. So in other words, just as being almost like the property manager, they were, they were earning over $200,000 in sublease revenue. So instead of taking over that lease, the state extended the lease. So it allowed, it allowed that tenant to continue to, to generate revenue as, as being the middleman, as being in that sandwich position. Let me, let me ask you about something. First question is, um, 
you know, you want to you want to get fair rental value. So you look around at the value of the property, the value of the position, so to speak, and you find easy to find that the subtenant is paying three hundred thousand dollars. Doesn't that enter into in the commercial world? Doesn't that enter into the valuation of the property and the and and the position on the property? Um, apparently, it didn't. Nobody considered it. That's what it sounds like. Well, I, I think it didn't. And I think the reason for that is because um, it was valued as as just the land. You know, that was the initial lease. It was a vacant. It was a land lease with nothing on it. Well, let me, so let me they, go to another question I have then. You know, in the commercial world, my recollection is you have a lease which um, gives the landlord mm, the improvements on the land at the end of it. Correct. And, then, and then you renew that lease. You, you let the tenant, uh, you know, proceed. Uh, the new rent is based on the land as improved because now the landlord owns the improvements. I think this is common practice, common concept, uh, common commercial usage, uh, uh, you know, in the state of Hawaii. Am I right? Well, that's not how the land division did it. And, and I don't think they, they didn't they, follow. They didn't follow the common usage in the state of Hawaii. Then. They they looked at it and extended the lease as a vacant land lease, just the land, and and did not value the improvements. And that is not consistent with with the way it's done in the business community. I think our biggest concern is without any kind of plan, they weren't able to prepare for this, you know, this eventuality. It, it was going to happen, and they could have prepared to to allow these leases to expire and do what you're suggesting, Tom. Uh, I, I mean, uh, Jay is to take over these properties with the improvements on it. And lease it out to somebody else at a higher value. That wasn't done. Well, okay, so you know, that's... it sounds to me like this is a, an appropriate examination. It's an appropriate issue to examine by the state auditor. It's an appropriate and reasonable concern that you found, an appropriate uh, report and recommendation to DLNR and 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 to and to the state. Uh, do you think you did a good job on that audit? Oh, we did a good job. We did our job. You know, we, we, you know, I have, I stand behind that audit 110%. I mean, it's, it's solid. And, and we did what we were supposed to do. Uh, and we provided uh, both deal and R as well as the legislature, as well as the public with a solid report that has findings that are supported, supported by sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Uh, and now it's for somebody else now to make the improvement, to pick up what we did, what we found and address it. Uh, and hopefully that's what this committee is, or at least hopefully they, they will do at some point. Well, in a perfect world, what would happen with a report like that? What would you expect to happen, you know, by the state, by the legislature after you submit a report like that? It would be my hope that the legislature would have a briefing soon after the report was issued. So we could explain what we, you know, what we found, answer questions that, that the legislature may have. And, and sit there at the same table with, with DLNR, the land division, and, and allow the land division to present its, its reasons why they don't do certain things the way that, that we think that things should be done. Now, that, that never happened. And I think in the last two and a half or whatever years since that report was issued, I, I don't think there's been much change in the land division's operations. And during these hearings, I don't hear the land division saying that our findings are off base. I don't hear any accusation that the information that we've reported is not accurate. The one thing that the land division disagrees with is that we think that for these income producing lands, that DLNR, land division, they have an obligation to, amongst other things, maximize that revenue. You know, it's the income, the revenue from these lands, it goes into the SLDF, the Special Land and Development Fund that, that Tom was describing. And it is the, the source of revenue for the land division's operations, for the operations of the Office of Conservation and Coastal uh, Land Management of DLNR. It also funds many other DLNR programs. The ceded land revenue, 20% of that revenue goes to OHA. The rest is supposed to fund other, other activities under the Admissions Act. So it's it's a very important source of, of revenue for the state, for the deal, for DLNR more specifically. So if you don't generate money, then the programs that DLNR can support, either they're not going to be as many of them, or they're going to not be supported to the extent that they could be supported. Um, you know, DLNR has, and I'm not saying that, that um, and I don't think the report says that 
uh, every land needs to be at that fair market value. There are going to be other, but it needs to be a consideration. There's going to be other considerations, like for instance, um, DLNR during these hearings has said one of the properties in Hilo, uh, the tenant, the lessee, is the food basket. You know, and they think that's a great, um, you know, the policy-wise, it, it, it's good to have uh, lease the land to the food basket at perhaps a reduced rent. That's not the other 69 other tenants in that parcel. That's one tenant. Yet that explanation is seems to be what DLNR is using to justify not, not looking to maximize revenue. And, and I don't think that that's appropriate or accurate. So, so can you tell us a little bit about what's, uh, what is actually now happening in the legislative committee, just to kind of bring us up to speed? Well, the legislative committee, um, you know, like I mentioned, uh, it was formed for the purpose, at least in the resolution, to follow up on these two audits. I think uh, as this, the hearings have progressed, uh, I think we've had a couple weeks of hearings, and, and uh, I understand from yesterday's committee meeting that, that she, the, the chair is intending to have another six or seven days, full days of, of hearings. I'm not sure who they're going to call and what they're doing. She also has subpoenaed over 22,000 pages of documents from these two agencies. Um, but uh, for some of the members, um, it appears very clear that they're not focused on the audits or the findings or trying to, uh, um, trying to understand what the two agencies have done to address the findings. Uh, those, uh, those members have focused questions on me and, and my office's operations. And it sure seems like their purpose is to identify fault with our operations and and hold us, you know, somehow hold us, quote, accountable, and we are accountable. But um, uh, the things that they're they're suggesting that we have not done appropriately uh, really doesn't hold any water. I think Tom would understand this because as a CPA, we follow the yellow book, which is government auditing standards. And there's a process in that yellow book. And we follow that process. And I've explained that process to the committee multiple times. And that process starts with a risk assessment to identify what the audit is going to focus on, the audit objectives. And at the end of the fieldwork phase of our audit, it involves a quality control review. And we call that independent review by someone in my office. So by the time the report is issued, we are confident, very confident, that the information is accurate and supported. That independent quality control review uh, it involves somebody that's looking at every sentence. We have electronic links at the end of every sentence, literally every sentence of that report that, that links to supporting evidence. So by the time that process is done, which takes you know, a week plus, uh, we're very confident in the accuracy of the report. But that said, we also toss that report to the agency, the draft. We ask the agency to take a look at that and we have a meeting that we discuss it. So if there's any concerns the agency has about the factual foundation of our findings, that's the time for them to raise it. Uh, and we did that process, we followed that process, yet now we are, there, there are many questions that this committee is asking about the process. And I've explained the process to them, yet it seems like you know, part of their purpose is to try to identify fault with our work. And, and the, that is not what I understood this committee to be formed to do. It seems like that is outside its purpose and its scope. So uh, the committee or, or some members of it uh, seem to be trying to defend uh, DLNR at your expense. Is that what you're saying? Um, I don't know if it's to defend DLNR or ADC. I think it's just more to find fault with my office or our work. Well, what's the connection? You know, we talked before here. Um, about um, various moves that have been made to find fault with your office. Um, is there a connection? Uh, I don't know. Um, I would suspect probably, but I don't know. Um, I think going back to this committee, uh, I've asked the chair uh, just to tell us what are you investigating with respect to my office? You know, kind of lay your cards on the table. Let's be transparent about this. And as attorneys, I think we both, all of us, we, we would agree that you know, part of due process, and, and I said any fair process, is, is to provide notice. What, what is going on here? What are you investigating? Let us know. And, uh, you know, that we've gotten, uh, the chair has not provided any kind of specific notice to us, any, any specific areas that, that she believes uh, the committee is investigating. So, you know, to me, again, it's, it's just 
an attempt to find something, anything that, that would allow the committee to criticize our work. So you're thinking that um, whether or not the committee comes up with some you know, real improvements or suggestions for improvement for DLNR, they're, they're probably going to take a swipe at you as well. Is that, is that what you're saying? Um, I'm expecting that. I, I do hope uh, that the committee uh, will, will, um, will find ways to help both DLNR as well as ADC. I mean, that really is the purpose of, or at least what I think the purpose of this committee should be. Those agencies really should be accountable and really need to, to kind of step up their game. Neither of them are performing the way that, at least from our perspective, they need to perform. Um, so it really is my hope that that's what happens. I think, you know, unfortunately, what's getting lost here in, you know, I see in the newspaper today, I see in the newspaper yesterday, I see earlier reports about the committee and, and the tension between the committee and me and my office. What's getting lost here is really the reports and the findings in these reports, significant findings that really raise really serious concerns, at least from my perspective, about the operations of both of these agencies. So, you know, I hope that we don't lose sight of the forest kind of thing, that, that this committee will at some point uh, see the big picture and, and, uh, and look at the forest and not these twigs that they seem to be looking at that are on the ground right now that are, you know, all these broken pieces and trying to, you know, point at my office or me, because these two agencies really, really need some, some urging to get better. And what are, the, what are the agencies telling, you know, the committee and, and, and you guys now that they're 100% okay and that uh, everything you found was just, it was just wrong? What, what are they saying? Um, I think they're not saying, I don't hear either of the two agencies saying that we, what we found is wrong. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think that uh, both of the agencies are saying that they have taken steps to address some of the recommendations. Um, I think the only place where, where there's a disagreement, or at least with respect to DLNR, is what I mentioned earlier. I think DLNR does not believe their obligation is for the income producing lands is to generate fair market value or, or maximize the, the revenue. And, and frankly, if they don't, and they just continue to extend leases, the status quo, it really is very unfair. It's unfair to the members of the public that might want to lease that land. It also subsidizes that business that gets to enjoy state land, using state land at a reduced rate. So they have a competitive advantage versus any other business that now has to lease um, commercial land. So there's yeah, many- like for the, the example that you mentioned was I think a, a prime example. You have, you have a business uh, that has one of these revocable permits. They're paying seventy five thousand. They're getting three hundred, so they don't have to do any work, and they can skim off two hundred twenty five thousand dollars per year for themselves only. And that's you know at least part of that the state should be getting. I would agree with that. It's not an RP, Tom. It was a it was a lease, a fifty five year lease that got extended for another ten years. But you know, hiring a property manager or somebody else uh, at at whatever rate, I'm sure that would not cost two hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year to do that. So the state appears to be losing some significant revenue just on that one property. Um, ADC, same thing. There, there are challenges with ADC. The difference, there's difference of opinion between us and ADC. They're not disputing the findings. They're not disputing the facts that are the basis of those findings. I think from ADC's perspective, ADC is an organization or an agency that was established in 1994 as Sugar and Pine were closing. And it's very clear from the purpose section of the statute that it created ADC, that their role was to fill, develop these uh, agricultural enterprises that would fill that economic void that was being created by the closure of the, of the plantations. Uh, they haven't done that. So for the first years, they did nothing. After that, they, they acquired the Waiholi Ditch and they became a, became a, a water, water system manager. And, and they acquired some lands on Kauai that came to them from the land division, came with tenants on it, and now they've acquired lands up in Wahiawa, vacant lands, former, former plantation lands, and they're struggling to get tenant farmers on those lands. Uh, I think we saw the news report a few, a few days ago where there were some fires on, on the ADC lands with some burned out cars, um, junky cars on the lands. Um, anyway, they, they're, not, they're not 
filling that void. They don't see themselves as that economic development engine. But they're so, the only state agency that is dedicated to building diversified agriculture, right? Developing agricultural lands. And, and frankly, I would have to agree that uh, we haven't been doing that. We haven't been developing agricultural lands. And our diversified agriculture industry is, uh, is, is undeveloped. Don't you agree? And I think that got highlighted during the pandemic, right? As tourism fell to zero, we didn't have that third leg of our, of our economy, which in the old days was agriculture. Uh, and, and that really highlighted the importance of developing that, that third leg of our economy, which is what ADC was charged with doing. So I don't know if, if that ship has already sailed, but ADC doesn't see themselves as this economic development engine. They see themselves as a, a ag development organization with these small farmers, relatively small farmers, which is very consistent with the Department of Agriculture's programs. They have these, these leases that they issue for farmers as well. Uh, ADC has these superpowers that they're able to operate almost like a private entity, you know, kind of like high-tech development, kind of like Oloha Tower Development Corporation, like Nelha, where they're able to do things without having to jump through some of the hoops that other state agencies have to do. Like they don't have to, like DLNR, for instance, they have to follow Chapter 171, which requires them to, to put out uh, leases for auction. Um, ADC doesn't have to do that. They can direct negotiate with whomever they want to, but really their, their responsibility wasn't to buy land and develop land. It was really to develop this industry, to work with private ent entities. So there are things in the statute that they're required to do. They're supposed to do an agribusiness development plan. They haven't done that. And this is you know almost 30 years since they were created. They're supposed to do marketing studies. Those studies are supposed to uh, help these organizations, private organizations, um, you know, develop, uh, figure out what crops they're supposed to, to grow, to fill that void that, that was created with Sugar and Pines closure. They're supposed to do transportation studies. So from the, uh, sorry, ADC's perspective, uh, they don't have to do that because the Department of Agriculture does some of that. Um, so those are the, the differences, I think, in, in how we read the statute. Statutory requirements that they're not doing, and they don't believe that, that they're supposed to do at this point because there's another agency that they believe fills that void. Well, so no action has been taken on your audit recommendations then. And the legislative uh, committee that was established is not really directed at that. Uh, and this is, this is troubling because there's a lot of money. You know, one factor to, to, from what you say, Les, is, um, is maybe an embarrassment factor. In other words, if I have already signed you know, 50, 60, 80, 90 leases sealed, and I've given them renewals or whatever. Um, that's done. It's meant to come uh, You know, you can't reverse that. So if, if you, the state order, to come in and say, well, you shouldn't have done that, what can they do? What can their options be? What would you expect, uh, you know, DLNR or the legislature to do to fix that? Because they've, they've already given away the store. Yeah, you know, that's really a good question because, um, you know, we, I, I hope if people are interested, they go to our website and they read these reports because we have a lot of information in these reports. So like, for example, what you're talking about, we have a, a little text box about Van Island Business Association. So the, the, pub, the state lands, the DLNR lands on Sand Island, that's the biggest revenue generator for the Special Land and Development Fund. About 50% of the revenue is from FIBA or Sand Island. So what the land division has done, and, and those leases, just like a commercial lease, it, it provides for rent renegotiation every 10 years. That's a standard term in a commercial lease. And really, it's really to protect the landowner. If market conditions change, and we see that today, you know, with the increase in the, the, the average costs of, of residential, residential homes in Hawaii. I mean, I see that in the headlines, uh, you know, kind of almost every day kind of thing. Um, it's really to protect the landlord should there be a change in the market so that the landlord doesn't get stuck with, in a situation where they're getting below market rent. What DLNR did, Land Division, is they agreed with SEBA to renegotiate um, the, the rent for a period that's more than 30 years. Uh, so the, the rent has been renegotiated and agreed to all the way through 2057. So to your point, it's locked in. But I think our point is that they need to have a strategic plan. They need to develop some, some 
long range planning so that they don't fall into these situations. These 10 year extensions are going to expire relatively soon. So DLNR needs to have a plan as to what they're going to do with these properties as these leases expire and they just don't do status quo. So oh, they don't have a plan. And following the report, which was what, two and a half years ago, they haven't developed a plan. Now the legislature is asking you questions about how you made these recommendations, but it's not asking questions about how DLNR is going to make a plan. Am I right? Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Well, Tom, this is a very interesting discussion. Um, you know, can you, uh, can you summarize where we are on this? Uh, and, um, you know, can you find out more? I mean, I guess, I guess the question I would leave you with, Les, is, is uh, what's really happening here? Can you talk about it? I don't know what the underlying motivation is. I, I think I said that earlier, Jay. Uh, I do know what's happening is this investigative committee, they don't appear to be um, within the scope of the, the resolution itself, the purpose and the scope of why they were, why they were created or established. It sure seems, and the committee chairs actually admitted that uh, part of their investigation is about my office. And you know, I, we've we've gone through that before with the with the auditor working group that the speaker had formed. I think we talked about that uh, uh, during another session. But um, it seems like it's a continuation of that, and I don't know why. Well, couldn't couldn't you have a a, a call or a meeting with the chair of this committee um, and ask? Um, I've had, I've tried to do that with the speaker and other legislators, and it has not been successful, obviously. Uh, so I don't know what the motivation is and why it continues. Um, but I do know it's, it's not right. I mean, my employees and, and it's, we're under threat of being subpoenaed, not only our documents, but also our, our attendance or participation in some of these hearings. And it's under threat of criminal contempt. And yet, on the other side of that, that uh, demand that we appear and we talk, uh, as I've repeatedly told the committee, we have a confidentiality statute or provision in our statute, 23-9.5, uh, that prohibits or, or allows the auditor, uh, work papers are, not, are, are, are confidential. So the auditor shall not be required to disclose work papers. That's what the statute says. The state ethics code also prohibits an employee from disclosing information that's public. So we have two provisions in our statute that, that clearly protect the information. And we give assurances to auditees as we go into audits, beginning, middle, end, that the information is confidential. So because of that, I think that we, we, give, um, we, we get more information, you know, more, more true information that, that is unfiltered from people when they talk to us. Uh, and, and we're going to, you know, basically walk the talk on this because we give those assurances. We're going to protect those work papers. And there's no reason why the committee needs to get into our work papers, except if they're trying to find fault with our work. You know, and that's the part that is really not, not right. It's not appropriate. What this committee is doing appears to be beyond the scope and the purpose for which it was established. Um, you want to uh, opine or uh, summarize and close the, the show? Sure. So where we are at this point is uh, we, we have a legislative committee doing something. Uh, we're not really sure what they're doing at this point. Um, they are gathering information and um, maybe kind of the next logical step for, for us on this show is to get the committee's viewpoint on what they're doing and why. Uh, but, but for right now, uh, it's a work in process. Uh, we we already have uh, the state auditor's uh, recommendation report, reasons for it, concrete examples, and you know, all of the things that uh, you know Les referred to. So uh, we want to. I think all of us want to make sure that uh, that our government is uh, more efficient and effective, and uh, is maximizing uh, the use of the uh, the dollars that we all feed it you know, with our tax money. And uh, uh, but this this is now work in process, and uh, uh, we'll we'll need to uh, see what the next chapter looks like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a matter of some concern because we're in a time when the state needs money desperately, and the state is leaving it on the table, and it doesn't sound like any progress is being made. 
uh, to develop a plan uh, to, um, you know, to get in the commercial world what a, a, a trustee with fiduciary obligation would get. And, uh, you know, I remember we talked about this before, but um, DLNR is, holds these lands in trust and therefore presumably has the fiduciary obligations of a trustee. And that's essentially what we're talking about here. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Les. Uh, great to have you on the show again. We will follow this issue going forward. Um, thank you very much, you guys. Really appreciate the discussion. Aloha. Mm -hmm.